Um, okay, so, uh, well, thanks uh, to uh, Nader and Tej for the invitation. It's Sorry, really but no, I didn't do the presentation, so okay, but it's, it's okay. So, so the, the last talk of today is um, Benoit Posader, and he will speak about the rigid rotation in 3D Euler. Thank you very much, uh, Nader, and thanks to uh, Nader and Tej for the invitation to talk here. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's my first time in Abu Dhabi, and I, I wish it was under different circumstances. Uh, but still, I uh, really uh, am grateful for. Uh, I think it's important to do to continue to do those uh, workshops, uh, even though virtually. And so, really, thank you for organizing it, and also thanks to everybody that is tuning in. So today, I'm going to talk about. Uh, oops, sorry joint work with uh, Yan Guo from Brown University and Klaus Widmeyer from EPFL. And in fact, this is a work that started four or five years ago when uh, Klaus uh, finished his PhD from NYU and moved for a postdoc at Brown. Uh, and then finally, we finished it earlier this year. So uh, if, you have, if you want more details and have a more questions, I, I uh, am happy to answer them, but I also refer you to the preprint on archive. And what we do, we prove an asymptotic stability for uh, solutions uh, for the rigid rotations for 3D Euler equations, uh, at least under axisymmetric as perturbations. And in doing so, we obtain a large family of global dynamical solutions to the uh, 3D dimensional incompressible Euler equation in R3. And those solutions are of the form uh, U is to uh, main approximation, this explicit vector field, which is the generator of uh, the rotation about the z-axis, plus a um, small uh, reminder, remainder. And uh, our main theorem uh, exhibits a norm that uh, I'll get to later. But uh, for the moment, let's say it's finite on Schwartz data, such that if at time 0, the perturbation is small enough in this norm, then uh, the solution as a solution to 3D Euler is going to be global and the solution is going to scatter linearly. And in particular, the perturbation decays in L infinity at the optimal rate, which even though we're in three dimension is only one over T in this case. And, uh, but th there is a, a, we're going to use a slightly different uh, viewpoint on this, um, which is, so again, we're looking at uh, perturbation of this family of explicit stationary solutions for 3D Euler. And then when we look at the equation satisfied by the perturbation, we obtain this new system, which is called the Euler Coriolis system. It's like the 3D Euler equation, but now you have this new Coriolis force. Um, and, and this is uh, what we're going to study because now the novelty is that this is no longer, uh, or that now this is a dispersive uh, system. And our main theorem uh, is, uh, you can understand it as a, a small data global existence for this, for this equation, at least uh, under axis symmetry. And uh, the comparison only goes so far, but uh, to some extent, it has some similarity with uh, the work of uh, Bedrosian and Mass Moody, uh, that looked at 2D Euler and then the look at the stability of the Kuwait flow. Uh, uh, and then in the, there you use, you uh, study this, this perturbation. Now, in their case, it's inviscid damping. For us, it's dispersion. So uh, it's only a, a very imperfect analogy, but uh, at least it gives you some idea. Now, one way to see the Euler Coriolis equation. Uh, in action is, uh, well, as you can uh, imagine from, the, from how we obtain it, is that you can think of a big tank of water that would solve to, uh, the Euler equation. And now you take your aquarium and you rotate it about the z-axis. And what you're going to see is um, a solution to the Euler Coriolis system. Um, and now this is something that you can do in a laboratory. And yes, and what we're going to observe is that this fact that you rotate it about the z-axis, um, as a, a result, 
you're no longer perturbing the zero solution for, 2D, for the Euler equation. You're perturbing a solution that is uh, as a velocity field, which is even very large at infinity. And somehow, because of the incompressibility condition, this really uh, induces a dispersive behavior to our uh, perturbations. Now, you can do it in a tank in a laboratory, but uh, of course, there is one natural setting where you have a uh, rotation that is really built in and you want to understand its effect. It's when you consider um, fluids at the level of the, the Earth, because the Earth, uh, of course, rotates about this, its north-south axis. And then the speed of rotation, that the effective speed of rotation varies with the latitude, but at least there are some places where you have uh, large um, scales when you can think of the, the speed of rotation as being more or less constant, and then you would have this Coriolis, this Euler Coriolis equation. Uh, now, of course, when you look at large scales, in this case, uh, you want to incorporate a lot more physics, and therefore you have a ton of uh, different equations, and you have a huge literature on uh, geophysical fluids uh, with uh, work of uh, Desjardins, Chemin, uh, Grenier and Gallagher, uh, Gallagher and Saint-Raymond, Dalibar and many others. Um, <clears throat> and well, so you have a lot of different e equations that look at different models. For us, we will only look at the Euler equation. Um, and maybe one thing that I, I should say is that in many of those works, then the focus is more on uh, looking at the linear model and then understanding the dispersion relation well, or uh, looking at the limit of strong forces and uh, trying to understand the, the limiting solution. And one particular um, such, case, such um, situation that uh, is very really related to our work, um, because it's on exactly the Euler Coriolis system, well, there are really two lines of work. The first one is by Babin, Mahalov, and Nikolenko, but there were also works by Grenier. And uh, they considered a three-dimensional Euler Coriolis system on a generic torus. And they showed that on a fixed time interval, you can decompose your solution into a first piece that solves a 2D Euler equation, plus a second piece that solves a linear equation, and then a remainder um, that you don't really know what it does, but at least you can make it as small as you want if you rotate your tank fast enough. And then in parallel, there is another line of work um, that was, I think, started by Duty Froy, uh, but uh, there were a lot of works by Coley and Takada and then others. And what they do is uh, that they show that, uh, so this time on R3, just like us, uh, that if you, if you fix any time, then if you rotate your uh, tank fast enough, you can ensure that your solution is going to live up to this time t. Um, the advantage of uh, what they do is that uh, in both cases, they don't need the axisymmetry. They can uh, consider general solutions. And in the second case, you can even do it in fairly low regularity. Um, but before we go on, now in retrospect, we can really see here in those two works, the two hallmarks of dispersion, uh, in that in the first case, you want to do a normal form. And so you restrict to a generic torus to remove all of the unwanted uh, resonances. And then after that, you do a normal form uh, that allows you to express your solution to main order as a solution to your uh, linearized equation, plus a solution to the resonant system, which in this case is some kind of 2D Euler equation and then a remainder. And then in here, well, you want to use the fact that uh, you're in a, an infinite domain where you have a decay, decay through dispersion. And uh, for them, they use a variant of the Strickard's estimates in this case. And maybe to talk about the relation with our work. Um, so in this case, for the Euler Coriolis system, you have a big parameter, so you can divide by it, and then you obtain this equation. Now, the first thing that you can see is that the nonlinearity gets an epsilon in front. But if you set your new unknown to be epsilon times u, then you can get rid of the nonlinearity, the epsilon in front of the nonlinearity. 
On the other hand, now you're talking about small initial data of size epsilon, if you, and then once you've done that, you've not completely removed the epsilon because um, it is still here. And so what you have is that this um, singular linear operator as is perturbed by this nonlinearity that uh, still preserves the energy. And then you have to work a little bit on this linear operator. But uh, once you see that it is dispersive, uh, you see that this describes a dispersion mechanism, but not in time t, in the fast time t over epsilon. And so if the dispersion pushes your wave to infinity um, in time uh, t, then uh, now in the so so now they should be pushed to infinity in time epsilon over t. Um, and so if you find a way to any way to use this mechanism, uh, then you should be able to uh, get a small parameter epsilon that pops out. And one way to do that is through the strict arts estimates, because um, if you can study the strict arts estimate when uh, epsilon is equal to one, then just by a simple rescaling, you have strict arts estimate for your solution. And now when you rescale the time, you're going to get an uh, epsilon to a small power. And you see that if you only use the conservation of energy part of your equation when p is equal to infinity, then this gives you no additional help. But the moment epsilon is, uh, the moment you get an LP norm with p less than infinity, then you have your small parameter. Of course, the full problem is a lot more complicated because this would lose you a ton of derivatives. So then you really have to uh, combine that with energy estimate from the full system to propagate them. And um, when you optimize uh, for this loss and the dust settles, you end up with only a logarithmic improvement on the time of existence. Um, but on, on the other hand, you do it for uh, non necessarily axisymmetric data and for uh, in fairly low regularity. And uh, the work of Babin Mahalov and Nikolaenko uh, can be understood in the same way. So in this case, you're going to do a normal form, which formally is uh, like dividing by dt, but now you're dividing by the fast time. And so then you again get an epsilon that pops out uh, in front of your nonlinear perturbation, or at least the non-resonant part of your nonlinear perturbation. Okay, so in our case, uh, we're going to start with small initial data, but we're going to set the rotation, the speed of rotation to be one. And therefore we can't really use this uh, fast time uh, dispersion, we really, really need to uh, add some extra argument to be able to go not just to time one over epsilon, but to go to globally in time. Um, but at least we definitely want to use those two aspects, the decay through dispersion and the ability to do at least partial normal forms to get rid of, uh, to simplify many parts of the nonlinearity. Uh, now this, I realize, is probably not too necessary uh, for uh, uh, an audience of, of experts like uh, here, but uh, maybe uh, let me still emphasize that the global existence was not really preordained from the structure. And in fact, um, if you look not at exactly the same equation, but for a related equation, the primitive equation, uh, there you can add the, this Coriolis force, and so this was studied by Tsao, uh, Ibrahim, Titi, Nakanishi, Charles Colo, Tej Gul. And uh, what they could do is to uh, produce finite time blow up for solutions to this equation. And as you see, this is not exactly Euler-Coriolis, but it is not so different either. And on the other hand, uh, the, it is not the axisymmetric um, assumption that uh, allows you to have global exist global solutions, uh, especially because in our case, the solutions we left swirl anyway, um, uh, because they were worked by uh, El Gindi and then uh, Chen and Hao uh, that really produced finite time blow up for this system as well. So of course, these are not the equations that we're going to consider. And in particular, those equations are not dispersive. Uh, so we will really need to leverage uh, the dispersion uh, and to see the, the specificity of our equation. So, um, well, let's do that. And from now on, let's uh, try to study this Euler-Coriolis system here. When you look at 
uh, those equations, one of the first questions that um, I would ask would be what are the symmetries and to which extent can we use that to obtain uh, global vector fields? And here the thing is good because you start with uh, the incompressible Euler equation, which being geometric has a lot of symmetries. However, we need to look at symmetries that also respect the, um, the background that we are perturbing from. And so um, in particular, the uh, Euler equation at uh, two parameter rescaling law. Now for us, we fixed the speed of rotation uh, this omega to be one, so we cannot really rescale time, but we still can rescale velocity and position. And so that gives us one uh, scaling invariance and associated the lead derivative uh, uh, of the scaling vector field. And then uh, similarly, the uh, Euler equation was isotropic, but now we can only look at the action of rotations that preserve the z axis. And so this gives us one parameter family of symmetry and another vector field omega. Now, this is good. It's two vector fields. So that we expect to be two directions in which we should be able to propagate regularity rather easily. But we're in dimension three. And so this is not enough. And to some extent, um, this is a continuation of a series of work that uh, we uh, did with uh, Yu Deng and Alex Ionescu and Fabio Pusateri, where uh, one of the goal was to try to incorporate as much uh, a, a incomplete list of, um, of vector fields in the dispersion analysis. So the vector fields are not enough to uh, directly give you the decay and control the solution, but still you would hope to uh, use the information that they provide as much as possible. And something else uh, that uh, I, we can remark is that we're going to spend one of those vector fields right away, because since we consider only axisymmetric solutions, uh, for us, every time we apply omega uh, to you, then it's going to be zero. This is not to say that this vector field is, uh, is irrelevant. We'll uh, see it appear later on, but uh, still it is the scaling vector field is uh, going to play the main role. OK. and so. We have two directions in which we expect to uh, have good understanding of the regularity. Um, and we would like to, uh, but if we are to do some stationary phase analysis, then we really need to have full regularity of our solution or the Fourier transform of our solution. And so we're going to complement um, those two vector fields with one more. And uh, we can observe that the two vector fields that, we, that came for free with the symmetries are the first two components in the spherical coordinate basis. And so we're just going to add a third vector field, this epsilon, which is nothing but d by d phi in spherical coordinate, uh, and then try to uh, propagate regularity along all of those three vector fields. This is good because at least we know that it's a good basis everywhere. Somehow, this is where it's a, a little uh, bizarre to some extent because given the, the natural symmetry of the problem, I would have expected the uh, cylindrical uh, coordinate basis to play more of a big role. And we certainly did try that. But uh, somehow, uh, this seems to be what works. And uh, we, yeah, so, so this is really forced by the equation. But I don't have a good understanding as to why. Um, and so this epsilon vector field is um, adapted to uh, make this into a, a nice commuting basis. However, uh, it's uh, or a nice coordinate basis, but uh, it is not commuting with the linear, the linearized equation. And so, in particular, to propagate, we won't be able to propagate a, a big, a lot of regularity there, and uh, it will have to come through a, a rather difficult dispersive analysis. Okay, so that was the first component that we want to understand right away. The second component that we want to understand is what are the properties of the linearized operator at, uh, so in this case, it's linearized Euler, but at this non-trivial background. And so the linearized equation, well, you, you get it by dropping the nonlinear term, and it is this. Sometimes it's called the Poincaré equation. And it's not necessarily so easy to see directly but the combination of rotation and incompressibility makes this system dispersive. 
And after you work a little bit, you can massage it into a variant of the Schrodinger equation. But for a dispersion relation, which is a little non-standard, it is this uh, C3 over C. Somehow it, it's a little bizarre, uh, but um, even in the context of fluid dynamics, uh, the same dispersion relation, or more precisely a very close cousin, also appears in a, a very different setting, the so case of stratified fluids. And, um, but as far as I know, there is no uh, more than uh, similar uh, formulas. There is no, or at least I don't understand the, the, if there is a bigger connection between the two cases. But OK. If we are to do a dispersive analysis, then we really want to understand this dispersion relation uh, well. So it is given here. The first thing that you can remark is that because it is zero homogeneous, the Euler equation tells you that the uh, group velocity is going to be perpendicular to the frequency. So you have this slightly bizarre case that um, the waves propagate in the direction perpendicular to where they oscillate. Um, and then, uh, because it is so explicit, you can really do all the computations in uh, an adapted basis, and you can look at the Hessian. And there, when you uh, compute its determinant, you see something really nice. And in so, and that is that you understand exactly where the Hessian is going to be degenerate, and uh, this is going to happen at two different locations. The first one is the horizontal plane uh, when uh, C three vanishes. And then the second one is uh, the z-axis, when uh, CH vanishes. And then the good news is that every point away from those locations, uh, so, sorry. so every point away from those locations, you can really expect optimal decay, and you're in dimension 3, so that would be t to the minus 3 half. Now, when we saw this, then we got excited because you expect that this is going to degenerate to some extent when you get close to um, those uh, degenerate uh, planes and lines, but maybe you can account for it with weights, or at least uh, hopefully it's not going to degenerate too much. And then, uh, so you, you start looking at it, uh, but then after some time you realize that, um, in fact, you won't get any better than one over T decay. And so, um, and in particular, there, if you evaluate your solution at the origin, then you can do uh, the formula simplifies a lot. You can do the computation, and you see that you have exactly one over T decay. So one over T decay is not the end of the world. It still is consistent with um, global existence, but that is barely so. So you will really need to um, do a, a delicate analysis to propagate all of your bounds. And maybe this is more at a, a philosophical or, or, or technical level. So uh, you can disregard that if you want. But uh, one of the main motivations for me uh, for this work was uh, based on this fact that um, uh, so in the last decade or maybe the last two decades, there has been a lot of work uh, for obtaining stability results uh, for quasi-linear dispersive equations, starting with work of German or uh, at least revived with work of Sherman, Masmoudi, and Chata, Gustafsson, Nakanishi, and Sai. But all of these works are done in the case, in the context of a radially symmetric dispersion relation. And certainly, this is the main case that you want to understand first. And most of the uh, classical dispersion relations are radially symmetric. Yet, it does come with a loss of generality. One uh, first remark that you can make is that uh, if you assume that everything is radially symmetric, then you start right away with a lot of vector fields. So namely, all of the rotations should commute at the linear level. Um, but there is something a little bit more uh, insidious, uh, which is that in the more uh, refined analysis of the, the quadratic interactions, you see that um, you, you will have to understand the uh, of information about a few functions, the one that control the space-time resonances, the one that control where the quadratic phase is degenerate, etc. And the places where uh, this breaks down is going to be determined by the uh, va vanishing set of uh, a function. And then in the radially symmetric case, uh, those will all be spheres centered at zero. 
And in particular, they either complete the overlap or they don't overlap at all. And so, for example, if you want to think of space time resonant outputs, it will be uh, on a sphere. Uh, and then you can understand it well when the Hessian of the quadratic phase is non degenerate. This will also happen on the sphere. And now, in the radial case, either the two spheres coincide and you have a complete degeneracy of the situation, or they don't intersect at all. And then at least you have a, a non degenerate space time resonance. And in this case, we can control them. Uh, and maybe related to this, there was a, uh, an extensive work uh, by uh, Bernico and German where they uh, studied more or less the first iterate uh, in a general case for uh, dispersive equations. And they saw that the output of the first iterate, uh, they could link its properties with some uh, conditions. And some of those conditions were always realized if you had uh, uh, radially symmetric dispersion relations. So anyway, this is to say that I think it's really worth it uh, to try to understand the situation when we have more general dispersion relations. And the axis symmetric case is uh, a step in this direction, where it's not radially symmetric, but it is still not too complicated, because after that, the computation becomes very hard to, to track down. OK. So now back to the euler coriolis system. So something else that uh, is good to keep in mind is that it's rather easy to produce some degenerate uh, exact solutions to Euler-Coriolis. Uh, a first family is uh, given by solutions that only depend on uh, Z, on the, the altitude, and that are uh, all uh, pointing in the planar direction. Now, of course, those are really far from being in the energy space because um, they are constant on horizontal planes. Uh, but then you can localize them to uh, create almost solutions. Um, so this particular family is not going to be too relevant for us because the moment you localize them, then uh, you're going to be big in the norms that we co consider. And so they should, whatever happens to them uh, or to those almost solutions, they are not going to be close to our exact solutions. But there is one family that is very relevant for our analysis. And it is this family of, of uh, exact solutions. This time, they only depend on x and y on the horizontal uh, direction. And uh, the first two components of the electric field, uh, they satisfy the 2D Euler equation. And this is 2D Euler equation, because if you're divergence free, then V is the grad perp of the stream function, and you get another perp. So it's a pure gradient, and you can lump it together with the pressure. And then the third component is just passively affected by the velocity field. And again, those are far from being uh, finite energy solutions, but uh, you can localize them to produce finite energy almost solutions. And at least what you would expect is that, uh, at least for some time, uh, you would not see the effect of the perturbation. Uh, and then they should be close to uh, the solutions that we uh, hope to construct. And now you see that this is a problem because we know exactly how the solutions behave. They behave with 2D uh, along with 2D Euler solutions. And this is really not the kind of description that we're hoping to get. And so uh, those cannot be described by the analysis that we're going to do. And this is where we use the fact that uh, we work with axisymmetric initial data because then uh, that would correspond to solutions to 2D Euler, which are radially symmetric, and those are stationary. There is no dynamic, and therefore we won't really see them. Um, and maybe something else that I should say is that uh, this family of solutions was already highlighted uh, because they correspond to the resonant part in the work of Babin Mahalov and Nikolaenko. And for them, they work on the torus. So now for them, the fact that uh, these are independent of Z is not a problem. OK, and uh, so this is uh, saying what uh, I just said. So now let me turn to the proof. So at the very big level, uh, the main strategy for the proof is what you would expect for a, uh, a stability problem. Uh, and the first step is to try to find 
um, to a good reformulation of the problem to uh, isolate two scalar functions that fully characterize the problem and that satisfy an equation as simple as possible. The second step is to uh, do a careful study of the linearized system. And the point is to uh, pin down uh, norms which are as weak as possible, but would still allow you to obtain optimal decay. And then after that, we start with the analysis of the nonlinear part of the equation. Uh, there is a step which is going to be very easy, the energy estimate. And uh, the upshot of that is that we can uh, propagate L2 control of many vector fields of our solution uh, and make sure that it only grows slowly. And then we ha have to uh, plug that in the dispersive analysis. And in this case, the dispersive analysis will be done in two, compo two times. The in the first step, we're going to um, improve the L2 control of many vector fields into fewer to control of fewer vector fields, but in a stronger norm, a norm that scales like the Fourier transform in L infinity. And then the second step is to try to get regularity in the missing direction, this epsilon direction. And in this case, what we're going to do is to propagate a fractional regularity in this direction. Um, through uh, dispersive analysis. And uh, because it's uh, so much uh, more difficult, then we only be able to do it in L2, but uh, then this will be enough for us. Okay. So let me try to say a few words about each of those steps. Uh, the first step is the parametrization of the unknowns. So in the case of axis symmetry, uh, there is a rather standard uh, parametrization by a swirl and stream formulation. So it uh, describes your function u in terms of those two scalars, uh, u theta and, and uh, the theta comp and the stream function. Um, um, just, and this swirl stream function. And this is good in the sense that um, it does one of the things that we want to do. It distributes the energy between, or it tracks down easily the energy between those two components. However, this uh, doesn't really interact too well with the, the Fourier transform that is going to be important for our analysis. And so we're not going to use that. We're going to use something uh, related to the Hodge decomposition of the horizontal part of the velocity. And indeed, this is motivated by uh, focusing on the linearized equation uh, and then massaging it. And then at some point, you see that you can get a closed system between the vertical component of the velocity and the horizontal curl of the horizontal uh, velocity. And now uh, you could say, OK, but this is missing the uh, horizontal divergence of the horizontal velocity, but the incompressibility condition gives you a, a relation between this and, and, and that. So, um, so once we realize this, and then uh, you can also see that A is, uh, so A, which is this renormalized uh, curl, horizontal curl of the horizontal velocity is more or less related to the swirl. Um, and so, okay, once you realize this, then you can renormalize a little bit um, those two unknowns. And those are going to be the two scalar quantities that we're going to uh, track down and uh, control. So this is good because, uh, again, we have this nice phenomenon that the, uh, they allow us to uh, really follow the energy estimate, the, to follow the energy that is the, just the sum of the energy in each of those components. Now, also, um, what is good is that this decomposition commutes with the uh, vector fields. So uh, whatever, uh, so this distribution of energy also continues to hold once we apply vector fields. And then the last thing that is important for us is uh, related to the nonlinearity. And uh, you can see that the nonlinearity is given in terms, is given naturally in terms of the velocity. And so what we want is to say that uh, once we express it in terms of those new unknowns, we won't really introduce uh, unwanted uh, singularities that were not present to begin with. Uh, but uh, this you can 
but this is true. Uh, so you can reconstruct the, um, the velocity field U in terms of those two unknown A and C via these explicit Fourier multipliers. And the fact that those Fourier multipliers are all bounded uh, tells you that, uh, say, at least they're all bounded on LP, uh, tells you that uh, this now, when we express it in terms of A and C, is not going to be uh, worse than in terms of U. On the other hand, maybe there is the hope that it can be better, that you can uh, start to uh, see something more in the nonlinearity. And a priori, when you start uh, expressing this new, uh, so, so the, we saw the nonlinearity was expressed relatively easily in terms of u. Once we express u in terms of a and c, then we get a huge mess. Um, but the good news is that we can really start to uh, put that mess into three buckets. And there are three kinds of terms. One term, which uh, are the green term, those are, are just the best of both worlds. So uh, let me just say that uh, they are not problematic. And in any case, for axisymmetric, they vanish. Um, then you have the main terms that we're going to consider, these blue terms. And those, um, so they are bilinear expressions of A and C, but they have this interesting fact that in all of the multipliers, we will get both a copy of lambda and root one minus lambda squared, where lambda is the dispersion relation. And what is important there is that uh, lambda is C3 over C is going to vanish on uh, the horizontal plane, which was one of the places where the uh, this linear dispersion was degenerate. And root one minus lambda squared is going to vanish on, so it's uh, CH over C, it's going to vanish on the vertical line, the Z axis, which is the other place where, the, uh, the, where we have degenerate uh, linear dispersion. Now, this is not the ideal case because uh, you have one copy of each and they can fall on either, the, either of the input or the output and all of the cases are possible. So uh, you don't really gain directly some smallness uh, out of those or some direct null form out of those multipliers, but at least in certain conditions. So for example, if you can force all of the frequencies to be aligned, then now they start to kick in and give you some extra cancellation. Um, and then there is the term, the leftover terms, and those terms uh, really don't have this structure. And uh, you can see that uh, those are problematic. And they are problematic, especially uh, if you look close to the um, horizontal plane, when, uh, so in this case, when uh, CH would be zero, which where you have degenerate dispersion. And in this case, in this case, this vanishes. And what you can see here is that you have the structure of the 2D Euler equation in a uh, vorticity formulation, if you were to let the vorticity to be this. And uh, same thing here, you have uh, the uh, fact that C is going to be passively advected uh, by uh, A. Um, and in fact, these are the terms that really drive those uh, extra family of solutions uh, that were modeled onto the Euler that we had to account for. And this is because uh, if, those, if we had to face those terms, then uh, we would have nonlinearities that we cannot control. And it is to cancel those that we um, uh, have to assume axisymmetry. And when you assume axisymmetry, then you can observe the one thing, which is that this is a gradient times another gradient, and then you take their determinant. And so in the radial, in the case of, uh, so this is, sorry, a, uh, the a horizontal uh, gradient times another horizontal gradient. And then you take the determinant of these two vectors. Uh, and in the case of axis symmetry, this is going to vanish. And then for the same reason, this is also going to vanish. And so uh, this is really uh, the, the key place where we use this axis symmetry assumption. OK, so this is the step about the. Um, finding a good choice of unknown to uh, try to obtain an equation which is as simple as possible. And in particular, now what we have gained is to have this 
weak null form that uh, tells us that at least in some cases, our multipliers are going to be better behaved. Now, uh, just one thing that the energy estimate posed no problem uh, because uh, as expected, the, uh, the vector field commutes right, right through the equation. And so this allows us to control a lot of uh, vector fields in L2. We can even divide by, uh, so because the it, it yeah because of the structure we can even get control in h dot minus one that allows us to uh, synthesize the uh, the frequency scales later on uh, but this is this comes as expected and then once we are done with the energy estimate now we have to start working with the uh, dispersive analysis uh, and to try to uh, obtain uh, the good um, uh, the good control on our nonlinear solutions. And so what we do is, well, we first, of course, diagonalize the linear system. And so in, so this is to the two unknown uh, u plus and minus. And uh, now following uh, some uh, strategy that I think was started by Bourguin, but uh, really in this case by uh, Germain Masmoudi Shata and Gustafsson Nakanishi and Sai, we're going to express our solution as a superposition of plane waves, and then focus on this uh, linear profile or the, the, the function that controls the superposition uh, of those plane waves. And those plane waves are exact solutions to the linear equation. And so when we plug in the nonlinear equation, then the nonlinearity is, uh, so the linear part of the equation is going to be canceled by that. And then the nonlinearity is going to force this weight here to evolve over time, but the hope is that it evolves slowly. And, and now, of course, the, uh, the, the, the hope is to propagate smoothness of this uh, weight solution, because uh, we can view this as a stationary, as a, an oscillatory integral. And uh, so using stationary phase analysis, we should be able to obtain good decay property of this function, which is what we used for the energy estimate provided we can uh, do the stationary phase analysis, uh, which involves some derivatives uh, on, the, uh, on the amplitude. And so this is what now we have to propagate over time. And so this is a good time to uh, introduce the norm that we're going to, um, to be considering. And so as we have seen, we understand well, so we can hope that our dispersion relation uh, is going to give us very fast decay t to the minus three half away from the degeneracy, the place where it is degenerate. And so what we're going to do is to introduce little root Pele family that uh, see how far you are from uh, those two places. And so one way to see it is that uh, our little root Pele family, so there will be two. The first one, which measures is the little root Pele family that measures the size of the horizontal frequency tells you how far you are from the vertical axis, uh, which would correspond to CH equals zero. And then uh, the second one is uh, the little root fam Pele family that uh, tells you how far you are from the uh, horizontal plane that would be C3 equal to zero. And then because we also have to uh, track down the loss of derivative, uh, we, uh, we, we want to extract uh, uh, the overall parameter, which is the size of the frequency k. But really the thing that play the major role are these p and q, which you can think of as uh, the angle of your vector with either the vertical, um, with the vertical direction. And so we want to penalize the case when this angle is either zero or pi over two. Okay, and once we have this, Two little wood Pele family, then we can describe the norms that we'll be considering. The first one is the norms from the energy estimate. So they are not, this is not too surprising. It is uh, controlling our solution uh, in high regularity and in H dot minus one, and also uh, some uh, scaling vector field applied to it. And then the two dispersive analysis norms uh, are as follows. So the first one controls fewer vector fields, but in this norm B, which is based on L2, because we would like to use all of the nice properties of uh, Hilbertian norms, but rescaled 
with those weights that have to do with the distance to uh, the bad regions in such a way that um, it measures the same information as that it counts as the L infinity norm um, when restricted to uh, a consistent scale in terms of uh, CH and C3. And so this is uh, slightly weaker than the Fourier transform in L infinity, but it has the advantage of being in L2. And for the purpose of L1 norm, uh, say when we do crude in integration, then it's going to uh, play the same role. And then the last norm, <clears throat> so all of this only had to do with the regularity in the directions of the vector field. And we see that uh, to do, uh, to gain the full regularity of our solution, we need to have this last direction, this uh, epsilon vector field. And the last norm is going to exactly control. Well, this time we cannot, um, we have to be careful and we are going to control one plus beta uh, derivatives along this vector field epsilon, where beta is, I think, one over 10. Now, uh, there is uh, maybe a, a small detail, which is that uh, this vector field, uh, so there is a special um, uncertainty principle associated with this vector field. And so uh, we have to make this norm a little weaker, uh, given uh, at least in the case when uh, we are too uh, vertical, so when the, when the, the parameter p becomes small, um, and yes. So somehow this is really the main new norm, and maybe let me say something about this, because, um, well, we have, it's going to, be, because then the problem is how do you define um, fractional derivatives along this uh, vector field, which is the d by d phi. And maybe another reason is why go to the trouble of having a fractional <clears throat> order of derivative uh, in the first place. And uh, this has to do with the fact that um, at best, you should be able to propagate, if you propagate uh, n uh, derivatives along your vector field, then this should be connected to t to the minus n dk. And we see that if we propagate one derivative, then this should give us one over t dk as we hope to get. But now it will be multiplied by a norm that grows slowly. And so in total, we lose this almost integrability property. So we need to do better. However, we can uh, observe that uh, at least this is still consistent with almost global existence. And indeed, this is what we had obtained in our first work uh, together with Chen Hong Wang. So, okay, we want to have more than one vector field. On the other hand, if we take two derivatives along omega, then we get some terms that are going to grow rather fast, like uh, t to the, at least like t to the one half. And now when we plug them back, then uh, they give us terms that grow too fast that we cannot really close the bootstrap. So a two derivative seems to be very difficult because of this fact. Now, what saves the day is that, uh, as I said, in three dimensions, we could expect it to the minus three half decay, and that would be more or less uh, tied to having uh, three half powers of the vector field uh, applied to our linear profile that should be bounded or at least grow very slowly. And this is exactly what we are trying to achieve. We don't get three half derivatives because ultimately we were almost good with one over t uh, decay, so we just want a little bit better than that, and so we want to get uh, one plus beta derivatives in order to uh, get this good decay. Um, and so now the question is, how do you uh, get these one plus beta derivatives? Well, uh, one way to do it at least is to uh, uh, introduce a corresponding little wood pale family uh, as was adapted to this uh, new vector field epsilon. Now, how do you do a good spectral resolution uh, for derivatives in this direction? Well, at least in this case, um, we can be helped by the fact that we're assuming axisymmetry. And so for an axisymmetric function, um, the action of this epsilon, well, so let's say we measure that in L2, we can see that it's the same as adding the uh, other angular derivative because uh, this is zero anyway. And so the L2 norm of 
epsilon times f is really the same thing as the L2 norm of the square root of the spherical Laplacian associated to f. But now this is good because at least the spectral resolution of the spherical Laplacian is something that is, um, that is well known and something that we can work with. And indeed, this is what we do. We introduce a little bit Pele family associated with the spherical Laplacian. Um, this can be done. There are some classical formulas to do it in terms of uh, convol spherical convolution with Rajan polynomials. Um, and then once you do the, uh, and so you can really understand exactly this operation. And once you do it, then uh, you see that uh, you, can, you have introduced as a new set of uh, little wood Pele projectors that do all of the th nice things that you want, in the sense that uh, they, you have a reproducing formula. Those two, they are almost orthogonal, uh, so long as the scales are vastly different. The L2 norm is naturally decomposed in those directions. And you have this fact that um, you don't have exactly addition of the frequencies, but at least if you look at scales, then um, the product of two functions that are have, at very different frequencies is going to oscillate at the frequency of the largest. So you still have these main properties that you use from the little root Pele analysis. You have this additional uh, uh, good thing that uh, this, this little root Pele projector, they commute exactly with, uh, say, the scaling vector fields, for example, with the usual little root Pele decomposition, and also with the Fourier transform. And then finally, you have this Bernstein property that says that uh, the action of one epsilon on your function, once you've localized it at angular frequency L, is exactly the same from the point of view of the norm as multiplying it by 2 to the L. And so now, this is what we're going to use for our norm. And we're going to multiply by 2 to the 1 plus beta times L times uh, RLF in L2. And now, there is just a, a small thing that you have to be careful because for us, the L infinity norm is really the crucial one. So you need to make sure that everything works uh, in L infinity. Um, so the good news is that the uh, harmonic analysis on spheres was worked out extensively by SOG. Uh, now, I couldn't find exactly what we need, but, the good, but we can really uh, read all of the computations by hand because the formulas are so explicit. Uh, the main thing is that uh, in a harmonic analysis, usually you don't really have um, the L infinity boundedness. But of course, we are not looking at any Calderon Zygmunt operator. We're just looking at uh, the little root Pele projector. So uh, in our case, then it works. Um, maybe one thing that I uh, would like to say, uh, or two things that uh, about this. One is that to some extent, we had already used a similar idea in uh, work of with Yudang and Alex Ionescu and Fabio Pusateri, but it was in two dimensions. And there, uh, the, uh, the all of the formulas were a lot easier because instead of having spherical harmonics, then uh, you are talking about expansion in e to the ikx, and then you can use uh, simple, much simpler formulas. And then the other point is that uh, I think this, as a tool, uh, is something that could really be used in a lot of other problems for um, for uh, dispersive equations in 3D, because uh, in many cases you will have uh, you will have to measure regularity in the spherical directions, and um, there having a, a little bit Pele family really helps you to get some of the the fine uh, 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 properties and fine analysis. So I see that I'm running out of time. Uh, maybe let me just add uh, two small things if I can. One is that once we have uh, introduced all of those tools that, um, that localize at the right way, then we can have a very precise uh, uh, linear analysis that says that a random linear function, we can decompose it into two pieces. One piece that uh, has basically the optimal decay in L infinity. And we see that in many cases, it's going to be like t to the minus 3 half decay, but in a way that degenerates so that if you want to sum over all the cases and you only get 1 over t decay. And then a second piece that don't get the uh, very fast decay. But on the other hand, this one is small in L2. And in L2, it is like uh, faster than 1 over t in a way, again, that degenerates. 
with uh, when you're too close to the degenerate sets, uh, but still in a way that is summable. Um, and so once you're equipped with this, then you can really start working the analysis and you see that uh, at least if you're too far away from those bad regions, then uh, you should be able to leverage this very fast decay. Um, and maybe one last uh, comment that I wanted to say, uh, for the second part of the analysis, uh, what we need to do is to uh, do something that is like the space-time resonance analysis, but a qualified version of it, uh, which is that instead of looking at where the full gradient vanishes, we first want to uh, use the fact that there are some directions in which we have better regularity properties. And so we look at the case when the gradient in those good directions um, and we, where it can be bounded. And the good point, uh, the good magic of our uh, equation is that we can really precisely lower bound the gradient and understand very well where it vanishes. And so using this, then at least it allows us to do a lot of integration by parts along the vector field in many cases. And then uh, after that, there is a, a lot of uh, analysis that goes into the, a lot of, of estimate that goes into the rest of the dispersion analysis. Uh, but maybe I should stop here because it gets quite technical and I've already used a lot of your time. Okay, Benoit, thank you very much for the Sorry. nice talk. Oh, you still have, uh, you still have slides. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yes, <Okay>. uh, but <laughs> um, I, I'm happy to continue. Uh, or maybe if I have, I, if I may, I can just say uh, one thing, which is about uh, interesting open questions, I think, uh, that are left open. And so that I, I think would be really uh, interesting to know. One is, um, is it possible to add in this resonant system? That would be to add in uh, to the Euler component in our analysis. Now, those components would behave very differently from a dispersive solution. And that would be maybe the first case where the resonant system is something a lot more complicated than uh, just IDTF equal uh, F squared F or some variant of it. In this case, it would be to the Euler, which is also something that we understand quite well. Uh, but, but a lot less well and, and certainly uh, than the kind of norms that we can propagate. Yeah, it would be a very complicated but very interesting analysis, I think. And then another set of questions is, uh, we have looked at one spatial stationary solutions of, of this type for uh, 3D Euler, but then you can ask the same question for more general stationary solutions, and then you get a, a more complicated variant of the Euler-Coriolis flow, uh, where the Coriolis now varies with the, the radial distance. Uh, but I think this would be quite interesting. And then uh, there are also a lot of other natural setting where you would want to add some, the effect of rotation. So for example, the, the MHD. OK, um, so let's see. Um, all right, so um, yes, so now about the dispersive analysis, so we're going to do, uh, so, so as is uh, standard now, once we express everything in terms of this, super, this uh, linear profile, then uh, the analysis boils down to understanding a bilinear expression of this type. And now what we have gained by the, um, the finding the right or finding a good parametrization of our unknown is that our multipliers that appear, they're all nice uh, multipliers times uh, root. So, and again, lambda of xi is xi3 over absolute value of xi. And so you have one copy of lambda and one copy of root one minus lambda. But uh, what you what is the unfortunate thing is that you don't really know uh, so they, they correspond to some angle, but some angle with the north direction, but you don't really know the angle of which variable. And so this is some vanishing, but some vanishing that you can really only uh, obtain once you make sure that all of the variables are parallel to each other. And for example, this is where informations 
like this are going to be very important because here you see that uh, the, uh, this is going to degenerate when uh, the uh, the input and the output start to uh, be parallel. And, but if they are if they are if they form a big angle between them and also between the vertical, then you would be able to lower bound uh, the phase, the derivative, the gradient of the phase, and not just that, the gradient of the phase in the good directions where you can integrate by parts. You can not integrate by part super easily because uh, this is the good direction in one of the inputs. Uh, but then once you do the integration by parts, it's going to fall on the other input and then you have to redistribute it. And it's going to give you some control of the, some amount of the bad uh, derivatives. But the good news is that it's going to come with uh, an extra factor here that is, uh, that gains use, that has some additional cancellations. Um, and one example that I thought was quite illuminating to show uh, why you can hope to really get to global existence is uh, this lemma, which is um, somehow it uses a lot of the things that we do, uh, but it, it is uh, simpler, but still quite striking in that it tells you that uh, you can directly get the DT of U in L2 uh, decays at a fairly fast rate. And in particular, this fast rate is faster than what you would have uh, guessed, which would be in the best case scenario, one over T, uh, because uh, which would correspond from uh, putting one of the nonlinearity in L infinity and then the other one in L2. And then I remind you that one over T is the best decay that we can do in general. Now, of course, this is not enough directly uh, because uh, we want to uh, get also weights. So, um, but still, it tells you that the moment you can do one normal form for free, then you're going to get this huge uh, factor that then you can trade for whatever other quantities you had. And the uh, way to understand this is really to uh, track down the, the directions of the input and output frequencies and to see uh, what are the possibilities. So one possibility that you, yeah, to see what are the possibilities. And so the first case is if uh, you have a triangle between all your frequency that is far from degenerate, then uh, you have this, you can use the expression that I had before and you can integrate by part along vector fields uh, several times. And then, um, and then somehow you can get better than one over T decay. You can get T to the minus N decay. Those corresponds to non-spatially resonant interactions. Um, and as a result, after this, you can force now your weight to all, um, you can force all of your frequencies to be more or less parallel. And once you can force all of your frequencies to be parallel, then you can use the two uh, nice features. One is that now you have uh, some smallness from your multiplier that uh, is going to be small as the angle that you're doing with uh, the bad regions. And those bad regions are exactly, and so this is exactly allow you to compensate for these bad weights that were in the linear decay. And uh, therefore you will now get access to this T to the minus three half decay that came in from the first component. While the second component, this one only had a one over T decay, but it was in L2. And so now the other component you can put in L infinity and then you would gain more than T to the minus three half decay. Uh, and so this is really already, I think a good manifestation of how um, you are really actually in business because uh, when you look at things in detail, things do happen in a better way than if you just had uh, one over T decay. Um, with uh, so so, which is what the only thing that you could use if you didn't have extra structure. And now, um, when you do the second part of the analysis, or in general for the bulk of the analysis, you're going to uh, have also the ability to do normal form estimates to say that okay, uh, uh, I also uh, so I, I don't get to use this. Uh, good fact about uh, trying to force the interaction to be non-space resonant. I can also uh, remove the part that are uh, not time resonant. And, um, and so you see that the situation sh should only get better. And there you can use 
an extra uh, property of your nonlinearity, uh, which is something like uh, this qualified absence of space and resonance that if on top of this the phase is small uh, then you you get to control well uh, the the gradient in the in the good direction and you can lower bound it by something that has to do with the multiplier with the weight coming from the multiplier um, yeah so, sorry you can lower bound it with something that has to do with the angle that you do and then uh, the multiplier itself allows you to at least cancel this one time. And so to some extent, then you get an extra one over T decay. And then you have to look at all of the different cases when you have all the angles are in all of the different positions and the different sizes. Um, and also you have to deal with the fact that uh, you need to uh, be able to see well this uh, this fractional derivative, so you need to commute with the, um, the, the uh, localization for the for the little bit Paley analysis along epsilon. But um, okay, then at some point there is a, a large part where you have to treat a lot of different cases. Uh, but I think using variation of the of all the IDs, you can ultimately handle all of them. So maybe this is. The only thing I, I think I can explain uh, online. Okay, um, Benoit. Unless you have specific questions. I, I, no, I, I think this is very good. So let, let, let's see if there are questions, other questions in the audience. Other questions? Uh, I have actually a question. Yeah, About uh, the case that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, with the uh, fast uh, rotations. Yes. So, so how would you change uh, here uh, the discussion uh, this, uh, this situation? So what would happen for faster rotation? Yeah, with the fast rotation, yeah. I mean, I would expect most likely that uh, you gain something uh, when you argue with the oscillatory integral, correct? Yes. So in all of the estimates that we, that we do, uh, then what would happen is that we, we should be able to get here some kind of 1 over omega, or maybe we get uh, 1 over root omega or 1 over the power of the rotation. So we could probably make the nonlinearity uh, not just of size epsilon squared, but even of size epsilon squared over omega. Um, yeah, so you see, in some sense, you get all of the estimates by uh, now just changing t to t times omega. And so whenever you have this, so maybe here, maybe we could get t to the omega to the minus three half. Um, that I have to say, I, I don't, it feels a little strong. Um, but would, it, plus, would it be possible also to remove uh, the assumption of the smallness of the initial condition? Perhaps. Yeah, I mean, so as we said, somehow when we divide by omega, uh, mm -hmm. we go from data of size one to data of size uh, one over omega. So probably this already uh, tells you that if the initial data is of size less than one over omega in our norm, um, mm -hmm. then you have global existence. And so then if omega were small, this would give you a large data, uh, a global existence. Um, that's, yeah, actually that's probably a better way to see it. That's good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, but no, I think my understanding at the beginning that you said, um, even though you are taking omega one, but by scaling it's, as if you, you, you can do, uh, th there is a relation between omega and epsilon, right? Yeah, yeah, no, omega is just one over epsilon. I just yeah, use small epsilon. parameters instead of large. Um, so, yeah, um, but, yeah, yeah. So, but indeed yeah. there are two, two ways. So one is that uh, it allows you to go from data of size one to data of size epsilon, and then also you rescale the time. Uh -huh. uh, and yeah, I guess 
So, so indeed, we could use, you're right, we could use both of those cases to, to get global existence for data of size one over omega. And also the fact that the uh, maximum size of this perturbation, um, u here, would be of size one over omega. So in some sense, we gain on, on both sides. Uh, that, that's a very good point. I think I, I, I have not really verified it, but I, I it feels almost sure. Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay. Okay. So thank you all. Uh, thank you to Ma for uh, Benoit for your talk. Thank you all for coming. Uh, so maybe. And thanks very much for again for the organization. Uh, this was a, a really nice conference. Yeah, so so that's how we. I, I want you. definitely to thank uh, everyone for the, all the speakers, all the participants, and uh, I think mostly uh, we have to thank Miropi for her excellent uh, organization. Like uh, I think she did uh, most of the work. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Nader. Thank you, Mirupi. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. See you Bye -bye. soon for the Bye, next everyone. round. <laughs> Bye.